Uh, good morning again, everybody. This is, again, is Dave Belusi, the Executive Vice President Chief Actuary here at the WCRB. And joining me on this morning's webinar is Tony Milano, our Vice President and Actuary. And we're going to talk about the January 20 filing that we submitted last week, as well as a new rate filing schedule uh, that we're shifting from January effective date to September effective date starting in 2021. So with that, a couple of points on logistics. Um, well, as always, if you have questions, you're using uh, the questions panel on the webinar software. We'll, uh, we'll get to us. We'll try to get to it contemporaneously if we can. If not, we should have some time at the end of the webinar to answer it. And for some reason we don't adequately address it or you come up with a question later, feel free to email us at communications at wcrb.com and we'll respond. Uh, the presentation, copy of the presentation is at the handouts panel of the webinar uh, software. Uh, there's also a link to the whole filing, all 300 or so pages of all those actuarial tables that's in the chat panel. And then lastly, uh, there'll be recording of this webinar uh, on our wcrb.com webinar site by the end of the day. So with that, let's move into the first item we want to talk about, which is our January 1, 2020 rate filing. So we did submit that filing last week uh, to the insurance commissioner. There, the commissioner hasn't yet scheduled the hearing. We expect the hearing probably within the next 30 days or so. But uh, we'll, once we do get a notice of when the hearing is being scheduled, we will uh, put that up on our website and I'll probably issue a wire story with that information once that becomes available. So let me just kind of summarize before I turn it over to Tony to really dig down into these, that really the driver of this pure premium rate decrease is pretty similar to what we've seen from the last several. Uh, the key factors driving it are we're continuing to see downward loss development, but some of that downward loss development is moderating. We're not seeing it drop to the same extent it has in the past. We are continuing to see claims settle quicker. Uh, it's been a pretty remarkable speed up the six, seven years since SB 863 began to take hold uh, in terms of how claims are settling. We're continuing to see rapid drops in pharmaceutical costs per claims that Tony will talk about. And in fact, we have a methodology refinement this year to try to adjust our loss development patterns to reflect this very rapid decline in pharmaceutical costs in California. And as well, uh, lien filings have continued to drop rapidly since the latest set of reforms that tried to address lien filings. Uh, the areas that you know we continue to monitor closely and uh, we continue to see increasing in the proportion of claims involving cumulative trauma. Uh, Tony will show that and uh, the same kind of patterns of you know where they're coming from and the types of claims continue. Uh, we are seeing indicators of increasing claim severity that after a period of very modest, in fact, in many cases, declining claim severity coming out of the SB 863 and subsequent reforms, we are seeing some signs that that's starting to turn and return to a much more normal inflationary rate. Uh, lastly, uh, loss adjustment expenses and as a one measure of frictional costs in the California system, continue to be very persistent, uh, continue to be at very high levels. So those are the areas concerned. One area that we're also watching that's not listed there is really what's happening you know, to the economy. Our projections reflect a fairly healthy growth in wage level, which as you know, since rates are expressed in workers' comp as a function of wages, uh, to the extent wages grow, that reduces the need for rates to increase. Uh, we're forecasting about 3.7% annual growth in wages based on information we have from UCLA as well as the Department of Finance, which you know, we use to develop our projections of future wage growth. That's significantly higher than it has been in the past and quite a bit higher than our net loss trend, which is probably about a half a point per year. So um, one of the factors that have been driving these series of decreases is, is that wages are growing quicker than loss levels have been growing. And to the extent wages don't grow as quickly, if California does enter into some kind of recessionary economy, uh, that'll definitely have an impact. So in general, uh, the recommended methodologies here are really pretty consistent with what we 
filed last year and the 1 1 2019 filing. Uh, we did, as I mentioned, we have included adjustments to development for the reduction in pharma costs. That's a new feature of this filing, as well as some of the adjustments we've been making in the past fi recent filings for the speed up in claim settlement, as well as the redu reduced lien filing. Um, the, as always, the key component of the filing is how we're going to project frequency to change in the next few years, as well as claim severity. On average, our proposed January 1, 2020 pure premium rates are at $1.58 per $100 of payroll. That does include the impact, and we'll talk about that later, about certain classifications being limited uh, at, a, at a payroll level, so that average isn't quite comparable to some of the averages in the past where fewer classifications were limited at their payroll going into workers' comp pricing, and I'll, we'll talk about that. But the average decrease is 5.4% compared to the approved January 1, 2019 pure premium rates. Uh, if you combine the whole series, if this proposal is adopted by the insurance commissioner, it would be the ninth consecutive pure premium rate decrease since the beginning of 2015. And in total, they accumulate to about 45%, so almost half. So it's been a pretty dramatic change in pure premium rate, advisory pure premium rates over the last few years, really being driven by those positive trends that are highlighted above. With that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Tony Milano to go into sort of the, the details of most of these key components. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. This first slide is showing the drivers of the 1-1-2020 pure premium rate decrease. The, the bar on the very left, that's what we filed in 2019, $1.74 on average. On the very right is what we filed in the 1-1-2020 filing of $1.58 average. You can see here the impact of various components um, of the peer premium rate decrease. Uh, the largest component was the one-year change in lost development, which was, had about a 6% impact. Now, the most recent quarter, the uh, March 31st, 2019 quarter, uh, had, a, had a more modest impact than the prior three quarters, only about a percent. So we have seen some of the decline in lost development moderating over the most recent quarter. The other factors had uh, overall small but negative uh, uh, adjustments to the pure premium rate. As Dave mentioned, the overall wage trend has been higher than uh, what we project losses to grow at. So that has, that has continued to reduce the overall rate level. It was about a 2% reduction just to reflect the impact of trending out to a later period for the 1-1-2020 rate. Uh, the, the decreases were offset uh, slightly by a small increase resulting from our adjustment to loss development for the impact of the pharmaceutical cost reductions. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, a little bit later on a later slide. To kind of go through the positive trends here, the first uh, positive trend we're seeing is on the loss of element. We've seen downward loss of element over the last several years, uh, continuing to uh, reduce the pure premium rate level. What we show here is the indemnity loss ratio projected at several different periods. The green bars is what we projected in the 1-1-2019 filing. The gray bar is what we project in the 1-1-2020 filing. What um, is shown there in the little boxes is the change, uh, the quarterly change from the prior December data to what we reflected in the filing. What we're intending to show here is that the change that we were looking at a year ago of about minus 0.4 on the more mature accident year and minus 0.8 on the less mature accident year. Those are much different than what we see um, in the most recent period where, for example, in the green sections, it was a minus 0.4 a year ago. Now we're looking at uh, it was pretty flat uh, quarterly change on the 2017 accident year. Similarly, on the 2018 accident year, it was about three-tenths of a decrease compared to eight-tenths for the same period one year ago. So it's showing some moderation in the decline, though still overall a slight decline in the indemnity development. Moving into medical, where we've seen the bigger uh, decreases over the last several years, um, it's a similar story, 
uh, where uh, one year ago at the 20, the 20, what we call the 24 to 27 month change was a minus 0.7. Now it's a minus 0.2. So the comparable change is about a quarter of what it was one year ago. Similarly, on the 2018 accident year, it's minus four tenths versus uh, over a point and a half of, ch of de decrease for the 2017 year one year ago. So a pretty significant moderation in the development decrease in the first quarter. So that's a, a sign that we are kind of leveling out in terms of the loss development change um, for the, the peer, impacting peer premium rates. Okay, another positive trend that Dave mentioned is that claims are closing faster. This is something we've seen for a number of years. In fact, our methodology um, addresses the impact of uh, changing claim closing rates. What we've seen is really an acceleration in the closing rates for more mature periods. For example, take a look at the 27-month ratio, which increased from 52% uh, in, in the, about three years ago to 59% of claims closed uh, for the most recent diagonal. You can see the increase on the gold bar um, over the dark gray is a greater, greater change than the prior two year changes. So we've seen that pretty much across the board for the more mature periods continuing to grow at a very uh, fast pace. But in the most recent year, we see some signs of moderation continuing to grow in the 15 month ratio but a slightly less, uh, slightly less change, about a point difference between the, the prior year and this year compared to some of the others that grew by two to three points um, on average for these, some of these prior years. Some of, the, some of the factors impacting the continued increase in the claim closing rates are related to um, recent reforms. Uh, they introduced, for example, SBA 63 introduced independent medical review that's allowed claims to get through the system quicker um, by settling disputes uh, in a more robust process. Other factors like reducing liens, a lot of claims have been held open for liens, particularly older claims um, with the uh, recent reforms related to lien filings, adding some restrictions on what could, what, how you file for liens, um, the amount of things that the lien filer needs to do. That has reduced the number of liens significantly. That's had an impact on these figures as well. And also uh, the reduction in the use of opioids, um, pharmaceuticals in general, but particularly opioid usage has gone down significantly. That is a factor that's kept claims open longer in the past. And th those are all kind of um, combined, having a combined effect to continue to increase the closing rates. And this is something we probably expect to continue in the short term, particularly for the older claims. Now, uh, digging in uh, in more detail on the pharmaceutical cost reductions, we've seen uh, pretty much since SB 863 uh, was implemented back in 2013, we've seen pretty consistent declines in pharmaceutical costs. Now, some of it is re related to reduced utilization of pharmaceuticals, kind of a result from uh, independent medical review and other reforms of SBA 63, such as um, you know some of the some of the re uh, reforms related to spinal implant hardware, reducing the number of spinal surgeries, some other items, um, reducing the utilization of pharmaceuticals. Other factors include the um, just the reaction to the national opioid epidemic, uh, just reducing opioids on a national basis. So it wasn't specific to California. This has been happening everywhere. Um, there was some changes in 2016 to, um, uh, if you, see, you look at the paper transaction in 2016, there were some changes to the, the federal government pricing limits that the fee schedule is based on. So that's kind of what drove that 19% decrease for 2016. And the drug formulary that came into effect last year has also been having an effect that came into effect for 2018 um, pharmaceutical claims. So overall, we see about 80% cumulative decline in pharmaceutical paid per claim. Um, we do see some acceleration in the decline in 2018. So we think that the formulary is uh, in a large part having um, an effect on the 2018 pharmaceutical cost, particularly on transactions per claim, which was decreasing at a rate about 20% per year. It, it was about 30% in 2018. 
Our evaluation, um, pro our prospective evaluation, estimated about a 10% decrease in pharmaceutical costs from the drug formulary. It, so far, with you know some early, some early 2018 figures, it does look like that's about what's happening, about an additional 10% decrease in pharmaceuticals on top of what was already happening in pharmaceutical costs. So that's um, what we've continued to reflect as um, the impact of the drug formulary in our filing materials. So um, the big decrease in pharmaceutical costs uh, obviously has a big impact on California workers' comp claims. Um, but what we've seen from our studies is that it actually has a disproportionate impact by maturity level. So this slide is comparing the proportion of total medical payments um, by, by year of payment compared to the date of injury. So for example, in the first year of a, of, after an injury occurs, pharmaceutical costs were about 6% of all medical in 2013. Now when after the, for the claims that have matured about 20 years, so for payments made 20 years after the date of injury, it's over a third, pharmaceuticals over a third of the medical costs. So a huge disproportionate um, uh, payment pattern for pharmaceutical costs um, in, in the total medical. So when we saw the big reductions in the pharmaceuticals, although there's been a big reduction at every single maturity level, it had a disproportionate impact on the later development of claims. So although the, the year one claims went from 6% to 1%, which had a modest impact on the development on the first year of medical costs, on the, you know, the 10 plus years, it went from about a third to only about 13 to 15% of total medical that had a huge impact on the development on older claims. Um, the, the way we uh, reflect our loss development projection is we base it on the, the development we've observed in the most recent uh, calendar years. So if we reflected this going forward, it would show up as kind of an artificial decrease because it's comparing the lower pharmaceutical cost levels emerging now to uh, prior periods which had much higher rates of pharmaceutical costs so that payments in 2013 and prior had that big 36, you know, 34, 36% uh, of pharmaceutical in there. So what we've done is we've refined our loss of element methodology to essentially restate all of our loss of element at the current pharmaceutical cost level, the 2018 level, and that um, in result had a, had a modest impact on the medical loss of element project, projection, about a 1% increase in the overall rate level. But this is restating the development at a common level for what we'd expect to emerge on recent claims because we're projecting for accident year, um, I mean, policy year 2020 claims. Moving into another positive trend on lean filings. So this is showing monthly lean filings. This is based on um, division of workers' compensation data. The What we saw um, is so prior to the SB 1160, which was the most recent reform affecting lien filings, it included a um, requiring, requiring a declaration under penalty of perjury that the lien didn't satisfy some other criteria, some other mechanism. Liens couldn't be assigned to a third party, and there was, there was a stay on any liens from providers that are indicted for fraud with a process to resolve those if they were convicted. So what we saw is prior to the reforms, which was about the last four months, uh, I mean, sorry, July through around October of 2016, there was about 25 and a half thousand liens filed per month. Uh, we saw some ramp up of liens in the transition period. This is common with a reform that when there's changes to the rules, lien filers try to get their liens in before the effective date, which was 1-1-2017. So that was something that we kind of expected and we don't count that in our measure. But since then, we have seen a pretty significant reduction in liens. In fact, it continued to reduce throughout 2018. And the most latest estimates that we have uh, from, from the most recent year, July 2018 to June 2019, was only about 9,000 liens per month. That's a total reduction of about 60%. Um, although the, that's a very significant reduction, there is still 9,000 liens filed per month. That's you know, still a significant number of liens filed in California. That's not something that really exists in others' workers' compensation systems. But it is, it is a significant decrease from the, the kind of what we estimate as the pre-reform level, which is really only about, based about four months. 
but our kind of best estimate, um, and an even more significant decline from before SBA 63, where there was about about 1.2 million liens filed per year. It's probably about a 90, 80 to 90% reduction from what occurred prior to SB 863. So well, what, what used to be a pretty significant issue has, um, has uh, subsided uh, substantially, um, and that has had an impact on claim settlement, loss of element. We do have a, an adjustment to loss of element for the lien reform, um, and it's just had a big impact on the system. Okay, now moving on to area for areas we continue to monitor. One area is cumulative trauma injury claims. So um, we've seen a pretty big increase since about 2013 um, in, in CT claim uh, percentages. This is a percentage of CT claims of all indemnity claims. So it grew from around 13% in 2012 to uh, now approaching 18% in 2017. Um, and continued an increase in 17. Now, this, that data is preliminary. It's only based on half of a year, um, but it's still showing a continued increase uh, similar to prior years. The biggest increase we saw in the CT claims was in the Los Angeles and San Diego regions. Kind of not surprising that you know growth has been focused in the Southern California area. Um, that's uh, a common theme with a lot of cost components. Uh, the and, and another item we found was that, you know, there's a bigger increase, a uh, bigger proportion to increase in um, claims from lower wage workers in those, in those regions as well. So uh, we have a pretty uh, exhaustive report on the recent CT claim increases called the World of Cumulative Trauma Claims. That's, all, that's posted on our website. I encourage you to check that out if you want to learn more about the CT claim filings. Another, another area to monitor are um, increasing severities. So this is looking at just uh, the total medical cost per claim. You can see there the kind of roller coaster ride of medical severities over time. Absent reform periods, medical costs in California have tended to increase. In fact, um, if you just look at the long-term trend without including reform periods, it's about an 8% per year increase. The most recent increase we see for 2018 is about 5%. Now, what, what you know, kind of each year we've kind of looked at the medical costs. We've seen signs of a return to more normal uh, rate of medical inflation. Uh, but then as the, the losses have developed over time, those, those estimates have severe, significantly moderated. So we see the same thing kind of happening in 2018, although we do see some evidence that this may not moderate as much as prior years. Um, that includes, you know, the, the review of the loss development change in the first quarter, which was more modest for this quarter compared to one year ago. That's a sign that there, we might be close to the point where things flatten out or even turn around in medical costs for uh, California. So this may stick more, uh, maybe more likely to stick than prior estimates. Next, we're looking at, um, this is a comparison of the medical cost change, which is in uh, orange, to the, a to the ALAE severity change, which is in green. And the scales are different, but this is just kind of show you the trend and how they are in parallel with each other uh, or not. So um, in reform periods, what we see, those are the two circled areas, is that when medical costs go down, the ALAE, at least initially after the reform, do not decrease with the medical costs. In the 2002 to 2004 period, ALAE Severity eventually did decrease, but it took a little while after the medical cost started to go down. And then in the current period, which was SBA 63, SBA 1160, the formulary, you know, allows several other items. Um, although the medical cost went down pretty significantly, ALAE has been pretty flat, so has not gone down as with the, has have the medical costs, and in fact increased moderately um, in the last couple of years. The 2018 increase is preliminary based on 15 months of paid ALEE data. ALEE develops much more significantly than any of the other cost components. So that's probably likely to come down, but we're currently projecting an increase for 2018 um, that's more significant than the medical uh, severity increase that we're projecting. Okay, this next slide is looking at um, all ALEE cost uh, severities. So this is just looking to, at the year-to-year -year change in the estimated um, 
uh, three components of ALEE. That's the ULEE on allocated loss adjustment expenses, ALEE or allocated loss adjustment expenses, and the medical cost containment. We uh, project that separately. So for the ULEE, that's the gray bars. It's increased each year, 2017, 2018. We really don't see any signs of, although other cost components have go, gone down, we haven't really seen any signs of ULAE um, going down. Um, that just could be related to, you know, a lot of the reforms, although they've worked well to uh, reduce medical utilization and some other cost components, they, you know, they continue to require uh, heavy claims handling um, to, to, you know, uh, work through the various components of the reform, such as independent medical review and independent re bill review, you know, that requires uh, additional claims handling that's continued to, um, that's continued to occur in California. And also ULAE is also tied to wage levels as well. And there's been a pretty healthy economy over the last couple of years. Uh, for ALAE costs, it's, and as well as the medical cost containment, they were pretty flat in 2017. We show pretty, um, significant increase for 2018. Although the ALAE, which is in green, that's a pretty early estimate. So that is likely to come down. ALAE development has been coming down. So that 10% is likely to moderate over the next several quarters. Medical cost containment doesn't really develop as significantly as any of these others. So the 8% shown there for 2018, unlikely to turn into a zero or a negative in the next few, few quarters. Um, so this was kind of surprising to us. Uh, medical cost containment includes utilization review costs as a component of the cost containment. Those were expected to decrease with SB 1160 redu um, restricting the use of uh, utilization review for claim for injury or services provided on claims within the first 30 days. In addition, the drug formulary was intended to allow certain drugs without utilization review. So we expected those to have a modest decrease in the medical cost containment for a claim, but in fact, in 2018, it increased pretty significantly as, uh, compared to prior years where it, had, where it had been flat to declining. So that's something we want, we're continuing to keep our eye on. Next, to take a look at claim frequency. So in 2000, the most recent co couple of years of claim frequency has been pretty flat. Now we see some decreases in 2016 and a modest decrease in 2017, um, which are more comparable to other states, which have shown uh, pretty moderate, moderate decreases, but not as, not as sharp as in other states, which have been about three to 4% declines in claim frequency, and certainly not at the flat level that we see for uh, 13, 14, 15, and also looking like 18 and 19 are coming in kind of flat. So um, this is something we continue to keep an eye on, you know, claim frequency, um, is a key component to workers' comp. Uh, there's been a long-term trend in California of declining frequency that looks to be kind of subsiding in California. We continue to project a modest decrease in the frequency going forward for our 2020 filing of about 2% per year. That's not uh, significantly different than the last, say, three or four years um, on average. Um, so, you know, not too far different from what we've experienced the last couple of years. The 18 to 19 at three months came in a small decrease. So um, that, that's what we continue to project, but it's something we're keeping an eye on because claim frequency is an important uh, cost component when we're trying to trend out to future periods. Okay, the next uh, cost component that we trend out is the claim severity. It's another key component, you know, frequency and severity basically gives you your, your overall cost level. Um, this is looking at on level indemnity severity. So on level just means that we adjust for changes in wage levels. So increases in wages impact indemnity benefits. We adjust this out of that graph. There's other factors like reforms that may increase impact indemnity benefits. That's also adjusted from this graph. So this is trying to look at things after we adjust for the, the known kind of factors that impact indemnity costs on average. So the 2018 is up after, uh, Pretty, you know, pretty consistent declines over the prior eight years. Um, so what we projected in our 2020 filing is a minus five tenths of a percent decrease in indemnity costs. This is an attempt to balance the, you know, the long-term trend and decreases combined with the increase in 2018 
as well as just what we observe over the long period. You know, there's some reason to believe some of those decreases, particularly from 2009 through around 2013, is related to uh, the Great Recession and how that impacted the wage distribution and cost levels. So some of that you may not want to project um, going forward in full. Um, some of the more recent, you know, but we are we are cognizant of the more recent uh, decreases. So our minus five tens is an attempt to balance kind of all those factors. That's that's basically been our approach over the last several years is to try to have balance between the very recent results as well as long-term trends um, uh, in California uh, to, to kind of reflect the fact that we've been in some, some transition periods over the last several years. Moving on to medical costs. Um, this, shot, this slide is just kind of showing um, uh, what I kind of just said, but it's even more of, a, uh, it's even more of a, uh, an issue for medical, which is that when we're projecting uh, the claim severity, we're not necessarily projecting what the cost would be in the next calendar year, which would be the 2020 claim severity. What we're projecting is what would be the ultimate change in the cost level for all policy or 2020 claims. So this slide is just kind of showing the percentage of medical that's paid in each year for policy year 2020. So only 7% of the total policy year 2020 claim medical is paid in the very first year, is paid next year. The vast majority, 93%, is paid in future calendar years. In fact, over 50% is paid after 2000 and is, is paid um, after 2023. And a quarter of it is actually paid after 2029. So we're talking many, many years in the future. So although we may, may continue to see flat or declining calendar year changes in medical costs over the next one to two years, it's unlikely that will subside, that will continue for the next 10 years. So that's why we try to balance you know, long and short-term trends when selecting a medical trend factor. So this is now showing the on-level changes in medical severities. Um, we see the modest growth in medical costs over the last several years and some flat periods and some decline. Um, our, our overall projected, what we selected was a 2.5% change. You know, that's again trying to balance the long-term trend, which has been pretty significant in California. If you see the change from 1990 to 2018 has been about 6% per year. Um, and that includes all the reform periods um, in the 2002 through four period and then in the SBA 63 period in that, in that 6% change. You know, take that out, it's about eight or 9% change on a non-reform period. Um, but of, of course, the more recent periods has been more modest. So rather, you know, rather than project something significant for reform periods or, you know, reflect the four, about 4% increase for 2018, uh, we blended, we've kind of, you know, tried to be um, cognizant of the, the recent changes as well as a long-term trend. And, and our filing has reflected a 2.5% medical severity change, which again tries to balance uh, all the various factors. And the fact that we're projecting medical costs for not just the next calendar year, but for 10, 20 years from now. Tony, before we go into kind of summarizing the rate filing, we had a question from a few slides earlier. Uh, you had mentioned that the CT, the trend toward higher CT claims were focused in low wage, uh, low wage uh, employers, employees or industries and, and, and particular industries. Can you expand on that a little bit or maybe point to a source uh, it, that goes into it a little more detail. Yeah, so I mean, what we looked at, you know, we we look at when we see an increase like this, we try to figure out what what are the kind of the hotbeds that are driving the increase. Oh, uh, you know, one thing we found was that the increase was focused in Los, the Los Angeles County area as well as um, in San Diego County, um, where other regions of the state have been relatively flat in, in CT claim for, in CT claim rates or even declining in, in some, of the northern, the, some of the northern counties. So that was one area we identified. But then we also looked at kind of the proportion of CT claims by um, average wage level from our data. And what we saw was there wasn't that much growth in the proportion in claims um, coming from wages kind of above about 400 to $500 uh, per week. But there was significant growth in the proportion of claims 
that were under $500 per week um, also focused in the area. Of course, there's cross correlations with the region and the wage level and also specific industries. Um, all that detail is in our uh, world of cumulative trauma claims report that we released last year. That's in the research section of our website, and that's that's where I would point you to to get more details on the CT claim increases. Thanks, Tony. So just to summarize the uh, where we are with this 1120 filing that was submitted last week, uh, we'll probably have a hearing scheduled shortly. You know, roughly a month from now, I would imagine, and. Um, Following that, the commissioner will issue his decision uh, on, on January 120 pure premium rates. Our average proposed 2020 pure premium rate was about $1.58 per $100 of payroll. Again, this reflects the fact that there's a few classifications that have a new payroll limitation on it. Comparing it in apples to apples ways to what was approved by the commissioner, uh, as of 1 1 2019, advisory pure premium rates, again, adjusting those to reflect the payroll limitations, was 167. That represents a 5.4% decrease. If you go back to what we filed originally a year ago for 1 1 19, reflecting the June 30 experience that was presented at the hearing, it was $1.71, so that's about a 7%. So you could look at it in terms of the WCRBs projection, there was about a 7% improvement from a year ago, mostly driven by downward loss development, as well as this combined negative trend since wages are forecast to grow quicker than losses. And lastly, if you go way back to uh, January of 2015, uh, the $1.58 represents about a 45% decrease from the approved average pure premium rate way back in 2015. So again, a pretty major improvement over the last several years as medical losses and pharmaceutical costs have, have really declined. The last thing we want to touch to, about with respect to this rate filing, the 1120 rate filing, is uh, changes that were made to several classifications. So we filed a year ago with in the 1120 2019 regulatory filing, uh, looking at classifications that we felt should have a payroll cap applied uh, to them. Specifically, we were looking for classifications that had a very high proportion of high-wage employees within them uh, that aren't subject to the caps that are already in place for executive officers and owners and so forth. Uh, also, we were looking for ones that had very low advisory peer premium rates because uh, that could be a function of the fact that there's very high wages in that industry. For example, uh, 8859, our computer programming or software development class, um, had a 2019 approved pure premium rate only a nickel, uh, five cents per hundred dollars of payroll. That's about uh, one four hundredth of the advisory pure premium rate for the logging classification. So dramatically low, uh, which is partly a function of not a lot of claims in that industry, but also partly a function, we think, of very high uh, salaries. Also, we looked for classifications where there was no indication of at these very high wage employees. And by high wage employees, we're talking approximately the Social Security max, which I think is at 133 now. We're a little higher at our cap for 2020. So uh, that had you know, lots of exposure there, but no increase indication of increased losses. And generally, we look for classifications that include clerical and outside sales, our standard exception classification, so that the the cap would then apply to the entire workforce for that employ an employer within that industry, not that you'd have the cap only apply to the industry and not to the their clerical employees. So the five classifications we identify that met those criteria are listed there. Um, I won't go over each one. You can see them. Uh, again, typically these are classes that had lots of high wage employees, low advisory pure premium rates, no indication of exposure. For those five classifications in this filing, we adjust the, adjusted the proposed pure premium rate for each of those to reflect the fact that historically our data showed their payroll is being unlimited for workers' comp purposes, but now they're going to have a payroll limitation applied. Uh, this next slide shows the details for each classification. Uh, the 
the 2020 proposed payroll maximum for each employee in these classes is at one, a little bit more than 139,000 per year. Uh, this shows based on our analysis of publicly available information from the American Community Survey uh, mapped, that's by occupation and industry, that's mapped to these classifications. Uh, you could see the indicator of how much of the payrolls above the maximum from a high for uh, 8820, which is law firms, about, about a third to a low for 8743, which is mortgage brokers, uh, 87 of, of about um, nine, I'm sorry, 8803 was the lowest. So you can see the range, uh, the range there in terms of how much of the payrolls cap. So essentially, the pure premium rate for each of those classes has been increased to reflect the fact that the payroll now is capped beginning in 2020, but the historical payroll that's in the data is uncapped. And just be aware insurers that, you know, for insurers that are, you know, will be adopting these changes, you know, audit practices and so forth will need to change where these caps are being applied uh, beginning with 2020 policies. Okay, so that's basically what we wanted to talk about with respect to our 2020 filing, uh, we did want to take a couple minutes to just to highlight kind of what what's going to be changing in the future about when we'll be making filings and what data will be used in them. A little bit of background, our, our current filing schedule, and it's a, a little bit complicated, it's part of the problem. We submit a regulatory every filing every year in June to be effective the next January. That has proposed changes to the experience rating plan and to the uniform statistical reporting plan and so forth. Uh, every year we make our annual filing as we did last week in August based on March 31 data to be effective the next January. What we're going through a process now, we have actuarial committee reviewing the June data next week and then the governing committee reviewing it next week as well is to the extent there's significant movement based on one more quarter of data, we may amend the filing in September. So it's possible that we make the filing in August, amend it the next month based on another quarter of data. And that data shows, you know, significant volatility and experience. Uh, lastly, uh, every year in March and April, we look at whether we should make a mid-year filing based on December 31 data with a July effective date. This year we did not. The data didn't move that much, but that's been the exception. Over recent years, more often than not, we have made a second filing, a mid-year filing in April based on December 31 data. So what are the issues around that? What, what kind of drove us to make these changes to the schedule? One, uh, we hear frequently making a lot of filings every year, multiple pure premium rate filings can be disruptive to stakeholders, changing changing rates more than once. Uh, California is the only state that has this multiple filing process. Other states only make one filing a year unless there's major legislation. Um, also the potential September amendments, you know, one month after we file is another area that causes confusion. Uh, there's a lot of timing issues. Uh, often the pure premium rate decision because of this timing doesn't get made until either very late in October or or the first couple of weeks of November. And that creates issues for insurers who have to have their filings for January 1, you know, filed 30 days before their effective date in California's file and use state. And so that creates, there's a lot of timing challenges around that. Also, you know, having filings effective January and July are somewhat counterintuitive uh, because those are the, the most Busiest months in terms of policy issuance, particularly January, almost a fifth of all the premium in the state is written on policies at incept in January, uh, many of them January 1. So there's a delay in the process in either getting experienced mods out or getting the rate decisions uh, that affect the biggest group of policies. Um, and lastly, the fact that uh, the mid-year filings take in a new accident year. We have the first look at the most current accident year and often that has the biggest movement in terms of the indication, while the difference between the mid-year and the annual is only one quarter of development, most often that's small. So it's a little bit backwards in approach that the mid-year tends to be the big change 
and the annual filing tends to be a small change where we, at that is when we change relativities. So there's a little bit of a backwards approach to that. So uh, we worked hard internally. We worked with the Department of Insurance as well as our committees to say, we, I think we could address these concerns and really come up with a better approach. So starting 2021 uh, with some of this activity earlier, the regulatory filing will be submitted in February rather than June with a September 1st effective date rather than January 1. So kind of a move up of four months. Uh, to a September 1 effective date. Uh, the pure premium rate filing, the one would be made once a year. Uh, it'll be submitted in April based on December 31 data with the September effective date. So uh, basically that'll move up again around four months or so, be made in April. But the nice thing, it'll use the new accident year so it'll have the, the most significant impact by taking in the new year. Uh, we won't make a second pure premium rate filing absent you know, major legislation or regulatory or judicial action, or if something's extraordinary in the experience, but we're not gonna go through a regular review to determine whether we're gonna make a filing or not. So typically, like other states, there'll be one filing made per year. However, uh, we, do, we will continue to review the quarterly experience and, and continue to publish information on it and make it available to all the stakeholders of, on a quarterly basis of, of how the data is emer emerging. So what are the considerations? Well, it minimizes the disruption, the need for multiple rate filings. It provides additional time for insurers to reflect the commissioner's decision in their own rate filings. Uh, even if it is a little bit late, uh, September is a very slow month, relatively slow month in terms of policy issues compared to many fewer policies than in January or July effective dates. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it reflects the new accident year in the, in the pure premium rate filing, along with more current classification relativity data that reflects the differences in experience by classification. And lastly, since we're continuing to publish quarterly evaluations of underlying experience in California's file and use environment, uh, insurers can reflect the quarterly experience as they deem appropriate in their own filings. They don't have to wait to the annual filing and they can change their rates you know, file for a rate change anytime they want. Uh, this graphic, I won't go through every line on it, really tries to uh, show sort of the transitional period. Uh, next year will be kind of a transitional year. We'll still be generally following the schedule of rate filings this year, just move forward. Um, some of them will be a little bit condensed because the major filing, rather than being effective 1121, will be effective 9. 121 and then moving into our schedule 9121 and later um, again we'll be transitioning to September 1 effective date one filing a year one regulatory one pure premium rate filing both effective 91 you know again no no mid years process no amendments with additional quarter of data it'll be one rate filing and one regulatory filing and both effective September 1 beginning with 21 rather than January 1. So uh, we'll have more information as we get closer, but we just wanted to let, you know, trying to get the message out there that to the extent uh, member insurers have processes that are tied to January effective dates, they may want to think about us moving to a September effective date beginning in 21 may affect those processes. So with that, um, we have a few more minutes for questions. We'll, we'll hang here for a minute or two to see if any additional ones uh, come in. And uh, I will, again, uh, remind you, uh, if you have any questions that come up later, feel free to email us at communications uh, at wcrb.com. The presentation, copy of the presentations in the handout panel. There's a link to the entire filing in the chat panel. And then there's a recording of the webinar we should have by the end of the day at WCRB.com um, webinar. So not seeing any questions. Um, uh, we appreciate your participation. And I do. I uh, will remind you that I think we have a webinar scheduled for, will be scheduled for next Wednesday. Uh, we'll have information coming out of that. That'll be uh, tied to uh, Dr. Julia Shang who leads our medical analytics, will be leading it, 
and tied to our sort of evaluation of the formulary based on data one year. Uh, are those savings emergency emerging as we expected, as well as sort of an annual update on medical cost trends. So that'll be next Wednesday, and there should be some information on that coming out in the next day or so. So again, thank you for your participation and have a good day.